Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, Kim Seltzer, a dating and makeover expert, where I will help you build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. Relationships have to start somewhere, whether you are trying to network for your career or looking for a potential date or partner. And when you allow different opportunities to get to know people, create a connection, then you can see if there's enough interest or curiosity to take it to the next level. Now, relationship building is one of the most powerful and important skills in dating and attraction. And I don't think people think about it as much. And nowadays, especially coming out of the pandemic, people have relied on swiping right and left to make a connection. But the truth is, is that the best way of meeting someone is cultivating a relationship, networking, creating connections in real life and wherever you go. Skills like communication, setting realistic expectations, and building rapport determines the likability factor, which essentially is responsible for being attracted to someone. So as you know, I've I've done so many wing gal sessions where I take people out and I teach them how to attract and connect with people in a public setting. And here's the thing. I see three really ginormous big mistakes when I see people either trying to approach or be approached. Number one, they do not dress the part. So either they're not paying attention or caring about dressing up to attract someone or they're hiding in their clothes. And you know my story. That certainly was the case with me in my black clothes until I had my red dress moment. Number two, they get in their head. They're thinking about, oh my gosh, what do I say? How is that person going to think of me? Oh, everybody else in the room is better than me. I mean, all it's like monkey chatter in your head. And then that gets you out of being present. So it's it's really crucial to be not only present, but also in your body and out of your head. And number three, you're too like serious and, and target specific. So there's a lack of this levity and fun. And, and instead, what I'm seeing is the resting bitch faces, right? All over the place or, you know, jumping into the conversation like you're in an interview or a LinkedIn exchange. I'll never forget a woman who hired me. Actually, she hired me to help her network. And so she flew me up to San Francisco. And I remember on the phone when she hired me, I tried to crack a joke and she just wasn't having it. And she gave me her credit card and she, she was just, she went into all business. I'm like, oh gosh, we got some work to do. So she also also wanted me to help her connect with influential people at events. And so we mapped out a big plan. And oh, by the way, she was single. But she didn't even want to work on her single life. She really just wanted to focus on the business stuff. I said, fine. So I showed up. And of course, I'm in my red dress. And she's in a business suit with her bun up on top of her head, tightly woven. And she, you know, pulls out her hand and shakes it really firmly. She's like, nice to meet you. And I, of course, said hi. And I give her a big hug. And and I thought she was going to fall over. So I, <laughs> I said to her, I said, look, I, we're going to go to all these places. We're going to have fun. But I need you to go home and change. And she's like, well, this is like business attire. I said, yeah. And it's very stiff. It's very dowdy. I'd love to see you in a dress. So she went home, she changed in a dress, and of course we had to do a little shopping as well. But then I helped her navigate the room and I did all these things, as you know, that I often do with people and helping them get out of their head and more into their emotion. And, you know, by the end of the day, we were meeting the most influential people in the room. We really weren't even talking about business, but she understood the power of connection through just like personal talk. And here's the kicker is that when we were in a uh, bar, when we took a break for dinner, she ended up meeting a guy and the guy asked for her number. And so it was really like powerful knowing that these skills apply both in dating and business. And at the end of the day, when you learn the art of relationship building and you make yourself memorable by focusing on feeling a lot of magic that can happen both in business opportunities and love. And with me today is a 
really awesome guy. I just had the pleasure of being on his podcast, and he knows a thing or two about creating connections wherever he goes and has built his business around it. He is the CEO of Small Pond Enterprises, which helps thoughtful givers become thought leaders by making their brands referable, their messaging memorable, and their ideas unforgettable. He is also the host of the podcast, Access to Anyone, which shows how you can get to know anyone you want in business and life using the time-tested relationship building principles. And his unique methodology, which we'll talk about today, has been featured in Forbes and Business Insider. And it comes from his own experience of going from being a high school English teacher to a Broadway producer in under two years. And he now speaks and consults on how individuals and companies can create referable brands for themselves so they can be top of mind for partnership, media opportunities, and more. Welcome, Michael Roderick. Are you there? I'm going to have you unmute yourself. <laughs> yes, here I here I am. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, my gosh. I am so looking forward to this conversation. And, you know, I mean, you and I have very, like, similar, you know, I think philosophies and what we teach. And, you know, we just kind of have different maybe platforms. But I would love to hear your origin story and how you got <laughs> into it, because I always ask that, too. And I mean, I know you were an English teacher, and but there's so much more, I'm sure. Sure, sure. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I always, uh, I always sort of frame it as I'll, I'll tell the Reader's Digest uh, version because I've lived about seventeen different lives at this <laughs> point. <laughs> uh, but basically, I started as a high school English teacher, and I went from being a high school English teacher to becoming a Broadway producer in under two years. <clears throat> so a lot of people were very curious as to how. And I was getting my master's in educational theater at NYU. And basically, I decided that I would try to study networking. So I started hosting workshops where I would simulate one-on-one meetings, job reviews, and cocktail parties, and basically have people act out these scenarios. And I started to notice a lot of patterns in terms of how people interacted with each other. And based on those patterns, I built a bunch of... I built a bunch of frameworks and what ended up happening was when I started teaching these frameworks, people in the entertainment business, which was where I was primarily at the very beginning, were starting to get bigger opportunities in their careers. They were starting to become more well-known. So eventually people in the business world kind of heard of me and I started doing work in that space. I became really well-known in that whole relationship building, sort of Mm. connecting world, got featured in a bunch of, you know, different, Uh, I was on different podcasts. I was featured in some books as a super connector. Uh, I ran a conference for a number of years uh, called ConnectorCon, where I brought connectors together from lots of different industries. And then probably about, I want to say four or five years back, I noticed that that whole market, that whole world uh, was really becoming a very sketchy place. And there were just a lot of people who were trying to sell people on this idea that I'll teach you how to meet famous people and then you'll be rich, right? It was sort of the, was kind of the main uh, thrust of it. So I wanted to see, okay, if I took networking out of the equation entirely, what still got me into all of the rooms that I ended up getting into? And when I looked back, I realized it was because people would talk about me when I wasn't in the room in a good way. So I decided to start to look at this from the lens of referability. I started to ask myself, okay, what are the reasons why people are talking about me? What are the reasons why people talk about my ideas? What are the reasons why people come to me as opposed to me having to reach out uh, reach out to them? And what are the reasons why when I reach out to them, even if they're at higher levels, they want to talk to me, right? Uh, and the more that I sort of broke this down, I realized that there were these main principles of referability that will pretty much never um, will never be at a place where they will not be useful. Uh, and you know, I think that for a very long time we've sort of always looked at differentiation as being sort of the the main driver of opportunity and business and success. 
Uh, but I would argue that so many people at this point have have written books or taught us some way to be different that everybody's different is starting to sound the same. So, (laughs) so, you know, my theory is that the only thing that still cuts through the noise is referability. And the three main principles that I recommend focusing on, it spells the word aim, is accessibility, influence, and memory. So first, can people outside of your industry, outside of the bubble that you're in, I like to refer to it as the echo chamber of the enlightened, can they understand you? Can they understand what it is that you have to offer, who you are? Second, from an influence standpoint, will people share your ideas because it makes them look better? And have you packaged your stuff in such a way that it makes other people look good when they share it? And then finally, what memory devices have you built in so that your stuff is easier to remember? Because if people can't retell your story, your story doesn't really matter. Mm, I love this in so many ways. And I'm also seeing a lot of parallels in, in the way people can date with some of this stuff. And, you know, you you walk the walk and talk the talk. Because I remember, I mean, you and I met at a mastermind. And you actually did stick out to me as being more memorable because of what you're saying. And you were more relatable. And, and I... I always say that a lot of times people don't remember what is really said in an exchange. It's just really more the feeling they had with that person. Mm-hmm. And I think what you're speaking to, which is such a powerful tool, both in dating and business, is that kind of relatability and authenticity that I think you're right, is almost faked now. It's like, oh, I'm being authentic. (laughs) No, you are not. (laughs) I refer to it as uh, faux authenticity. Oh, my God. I love it. Like faux fur, faux leather. Exactly. Oh, my God. (laughs) It could be a whole other podcast. Um, Yeah, like that. That is really interesting. And so, yeah, I I like this theory about. So let me see if I have it right. Accessory implementing and memory. Uh, accessibility, oh, accessibility. Uh, uh-huh. influence and memory. Oh, I had it all wrong. See, I didn't, I didn't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write it down. Yeah, because it's, um, it, it is great. So like, let's say, and, and I'm just wondering how, cause a lot of listeners are single. Let's say people walk into a room and they want to use this kind of tactic or framework. Let's say it's a woman Okay. And she sees a really cute man. And I know like a lot of women think that it's the man's job to approach her. But what I always say is that if your cap light's not on and you're not approachable, it ain't going to happen. So what, what can she do to kind of create that response, that authentic connection? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that the first thing is you do have to look at how accessible are you um, just from just just from a very, very basic standpoint. Like, how are you standing? How are you presenting yourself when you're in that, you know, when you're in that room? We forget so, so often, especially when we're in sort of moments of uh, insecurity and, and, and fear, mm. how closed we become from a body language standpoint. Yeah. Whether it be crossing our arms, whether it be um, making ourselves small, putting ourselves into a corner, uh, looking at our phones, uh, you know, any number of these things basically communicate to people that you do not want to be approached, that you do not want to be bothered. And when you are in that place, right? When you're in that place where basically you are kind of closing yourself off, well, nobody is going to come up to you and try to have a conversation Mm -hmm. if it feels like you're already closed off to them, right? If it feels like there's just no way 
uh, to sort of uh, make it uh, make it work. But I do want to I do want to talk about one thing that I think can really help with this. If mm-hmm. if anybody's out there and they're 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 listening, and maybe you just came into one of these like massive gatherings and you're thinking, oh my God, I just, I can't, I can't deal with this. And the metaphor that I like to use is when you go to one of these large events, in essence, it's the ocean. And Mm. there are a number of archetypes in that ocean. And your first archetype is what I refer to as the shark. And that's the individual who is, in essence, chewing up the scenery, right? They're they're <laughs> either handing up the business, you know, handing out the business cards. They're in everybody's yeah. face. It's all about them. They want all the attention, uh, and they're basically just sort of like moving around that room in much the same way a shark would, just sort of darting from person to person. Then you have the dolphins. And the dolphins are the people who basically they came with their friends and they've decided that they want to stay with their friends. Oh my <laughs> and, god, this is brilliant. <laughs> and they cluster together, right? And, and and they cluster together and you basically end up seeing people who sort of are on the outskirts of those conversations or sort of standing, you know, um, you know, out to, to sort of to the side. And the people who are standing out out on that sort of outer part, the people who are being attacked by a shark, the people who are standing by uh, you know, the, the food, the people who are standing at the bar, just kind of looking longingly at the whole thing. That's those who are drowning, right? Mm-hmm. Those are the people who are drowning. But there's a last category. And I would argue that if you were feeling intense, an intense sense of anxiety in a crowded environment, if you can uh, fall into this archetype, it will actually take away most of your anxiety. And that archetype is the lifeguard. And the lifeguard looks around the room for who is uncomfortable who is not necessarily having a good time and they go up and they say hello. And every once in a while you may encounter somebody who's drowning, who's like, please just let me drown. Right. Every Mm -hmm. once in a while. But most of the time the person's like, thank you for saving me. Thank you for getting me out of this awkward situation that I'm in. So I often will tell people if you are feeling overwhelmed at one of these events, be a lifeguard. Look mm-hmm. around, see if there is somebody who is in a similar type of situation, or maybe they're standing outside of a group of dolphins, maybe they're standing by the bar or whatever that is, and go up and simply take them out of their misery of standing there, waiting, looking anxious, you know, et cetera. Now, here's the thing. Going back to what I was just saying, if you're not otherwise engaged, if you're not looking at your phone, if you're Mm -hmm. not doing some other activity, if you're not closing off all of your body language, then you actually make it very clear to other lifeguards that you're in open water. Mm -hmm. And they will come and want to say hello. They will want to support you. So the the mistake that I see most people make when it comes to accessibility is that when they're feeling that sense of anxiety, they either don't take on that lifeguard persona and look for other people and basically establish bonds with other people who are uncomfortable, or they close themselves off so much that if anybody is looking for somebody to talk to or somebody to help, they just pass them right by. Mm-hmm. That is brilliant. And again, so digestible the way that you explained it. You're so good at what you do. Yeah. Cause I, I think that even just simplifying it in that way can ease a lot of anxiety, you know, knowing the different archetypes. And it's funny I told a woman to do exactly what you're saying, but I didn't have the the shark dolphin lifeguard uh, metaphor to use with her because she was going to these events and she was getting completely just 
riddled with anxiety. I mean, she just mm. hated going, yet she had to do it at work. And it was a great place for her to meet possible, you know, men. And, mm-hmm. and But most importantly, just even fabulous women. Like, she needed more wing gals in her life, too. So I said, well, what's happening in your head when you walk into the room? And she's like, well, I just, I, I feel like... I did when I was in junior high. Everybody knows everybody. Everyone's in their circles. And I I have no place for myself. I feel like that fish out of water, so to speak. And I said, well, what if you just called, called that out of yourself? What if you just said that? She's like, what? I said, yeah. What if you walked up to a group of women and said, I've been, I've been coming here and it's funny because I feel like I somehow are back in junior high. Hi, my name is. And so it was super hard for her, but she did it. And Mm -hmm. she said, Kim, it worked brilliantly because everybody's felt that way before, especially women. Right. And so when you also come from that state of vulnerability, after you know the lifeguard and the shark and all that jazz, like, I, I think that's such a great, thing to do for yourself. And really that's half the battle. It's just, you know, what we have in our heads are always worse than the reality. I, Oh yeah. Every oh, yeah. Time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think that the, you know, the thing is, and I, so I write, I write a daily email and one of the, one of the mm-hmm. questions that comes up all the time is sort of how do you write daily? How, how is it even possible that you just like every day come up with something, you know, come up with something to write? And what I often will tell people is that I give myself permission to suck. I recognize (laughs) that there is absolutely no way that I can be consistent and brilliant. There's just going to like, there's going to be things that are going to be okay. There's going to be things that are going to be bad. There's going to be things that are going to, you know, um, that are going to really take off. And they're going to be things that I think are really going to take off that do nothing. And they're going to be things that I think are, are, are lousy that, that completely take off. Right. And, and the thing is, and I would say this is probably one of the most important things that you can do for yourself, no matter what it is that you're, what whatever it is that you're going for, whether or not you're trying to find a mate, whether or not you are, you know, trying to grow your business, build a career, talk to an influ- influential person. And it's, uh, I refer to it as the tennis novice versus the tennis pro approach, right? So mm-hmm. if a tennis novice misses a shot, in many cases, the game is over because the tennis novice is now in their head the whole time thinking about the fact that they missed the shot. They're agonizing over it. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they're worried. So usually the game is done They and, and they lose. And the core reason why is that the tennis novice is a slave to the product. If they don't receive the product, if they don't get the thing that they want. They're utterly crushed. Whereas a tennis pro misses a shot and says, okay, where was I standing when I missed that shot? Where was the other person standing? How does this go? And they basically continue the game. And even if they lose the game, they say, okay, what can I learn from this loss? How do I sort of figure this out? And then they go and they do it again. And the reason that they're able to do this again is that the tennis pro is a student of the process. And when you make yourself a student of the process as opposed to a slave to the product, Basically, what happens is failure is no longer failure. It's new information. All you're doing is studying. All you're doing is market research and learning as much as you possibly can. And when you start to approach things that way, when you basically say, okay, that didn't work, that's new information for me, you are able to refine, develop, and you're just not crushed. I think that the biggest, the, the, the biggest enemy in your life is expectation. Like the more that you, you know, have an expectation that something's going to happen and the more weight that you put on that expectation, the harder it is if that thing doesn't happen that you were, you know, that, that you were hoping for, that you were looking for. So if you approach things without expectation and you basically just say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to see kind of where it leads. I'm going to see what happens. And you just let go of that expectation. If you don't say, I need this, most of the time you'll get it. 
I so love this. <laughs> I can't tell you. I'm smiling. You can't see me right now, but I, the reason why this is so fun and I, you know, for you listening, this is what I talk about all the time when I refer to it as data dating. And I will often put people on a dating regimen where they go online and they have a bunch of conversations. And I say, in no way, shape, or form, do I want you thinking about this person as a boyfriend or a girlfriend. You are simply doing it for the act of having conversations and making connections. I don't even want you getting in a relationship with any of these people. And often they end up getting in a relationship because of that. <laughs> because of that. But it is, it's, it's dating like a tennis pro versus the novice is like what you're saying. So it's a brilliant way that you explained it. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder, okay, so are there any other kind of time-tested relationship building principles that you teach that you wanted to share? Because I know that like that, that's a big piece of what you do. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, uh, I often refer to a lot of this stuff as sort of my greatest hits, right? Um, <laughs> because I've spent, you know, years sort of thinking about them and sort of talk, you know, um, talking about them. And I'm trying to think of ones that could be really useful um, when you sort of think about more of the sort of like, you know, personal relationship side of things. But actually, I think this, actually, this principle could be interesting in both the personal relationship side of things, as well as the business relationship side of things. Uh, and it's basically this idea of relationship debt. And um, a lot of the time, if you are a very giving, a very, very supportive person, and if you love to help, you tend to be far more likely to turn down help right? You tend to be far more likely to, to tell somebody, nope, nope, it's okay. It's okay. I'll do this thing. I'll do this thing. I'll do this thing. I'll do this thing. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is that when you are that person who's just always doing something for somebody and you're never actually letting them know what it is that you're, you need, you're never actually asking them for anything, whether or not they realize it's happening, subconsciously, there starts to become this feeling of an accumulation of debt, almost like a credit card. So you've done something for them. They've said, you know, they, they've said, thank you. They've said, how can I repay you? Or let me do something for you. And you say, oh, no, no, no. I just want to help. I just want to support. I just want to, et cetera. And then they come to you again and you give them something else. You give them something else. And next thing you know, they're avoiding you. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be around you. And the reason is they're sidled with all of this relationship debt. They're feeling like there's no way that they could possibly ever pay you back. So just like somebody who has a, a credit card bill that they know they can't, they, they can't satisfy starts ignoring the numbers, they're ignoring your calls, <laughs> right? That's awesome. <laughs> and and I, I think like this is one of the, the core reasons why it is so important to let people know what it is that you need to make sure that there is a back and forth, that there is more of a flow in your relationship. Because I think that a lot of the time, the mistakes that people who love to give and love to help and love to support make is that they, they do so much for everybody else and they don't take care of themselves. I, I refer to this as the giver's fix, where in mm -hmm. essence, every time we give, we get a chemical rush. And some say it's oxytocin, some say it's dopamine, but regardless of the chemical, we get a rush whenever we give. Yep. We do not get any lovely chemical rush from asking. So much like an addict it's very easy to just keep giving and, and, and getting that rush and basically feeling great because we're helping everybody else and let ourselves actually fall apart. Right. Mm -hmm. And not have enough, you know, and not have enough for ourselves. And the, the mindset shift that I, that, that I love to sort of throw into the mix there is that if you were doing that, you're actually being more selfish 
Yes. Oh gosh, I <laughs> all the time, Michael. Go for it. <laughs> because <laughs> you are not you. Yeah. you are not allowing that other person to feel the joy mm-hmm. and feel that rush by giving to you. So you're actually robbing them of that oxytocin. You're robbing them of that experience because you're hogging all of it for yourself. You're hogging all of that good feeling from doing the giving by never actually allowing yourself to receive. That is so I hope you listening are taking like really big notes right now. That that was gold, how you framed it just now. Because I work with so many, I call I call them over caregivers. And and then what happens and the, the, the tug of war, I think what it becomes is that their confidence, the, the oxytocin, the drug that you're referring to, becomes a person's confidence. So in times of stress or insecurity on a date or in like a social event, people will default back to what they know, and that is to overgive, to listen, to not share. And guess what that does? It attracts the sharks. And we all know who the sharks are if we want to like diagnose them, but <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> I, I overuse that word a lot. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really important also to see how that it is a self-ish thing. And when you allow people to have more of that reciprocity, you ha- you get more even and healthy type of relationships too. I mean, that's that's the beauty that comes out of it. Because really, at the end of the day, that being too nice is also a sense of control. And so if you relinquish that and allow people to give to you and receive it, then you will have that kind of even ground type of relationship. Yeah. And, and the thing that I often like to think about is, is that relationships are a dialogue. They're not a monologue. Mm. And, and I think that a lot of the time we make that mistake of turning it into a monologue without even letting our scene partner know, right? Where it's like, we're running the show now. We're saying, we're telling them how they should feel. We're telling them how they should, you know, how they should think we're, we're doing, you know, everything, you know, for, you know, for them. And when somebody feels like they don't belong there when uh i've i've often referred to this as uh, i talk about this in the in the context of if you've ever been to an event uh and basically two people are you're talking to somebody and then all of a sudden somebody else comes up and they both start talking to each other and then you're gone i call it bruce bruce willising um (laughs) (laughs) it's like (laughs) you know um, where all of a sudden it's like you're just you're just not there um and and the thing is that that can happen in a two-way conversation where you can get bruce willis where the other person has just sort of decided you know what i'm going to basically ignore you i'm i'm gonna you know act like you're not there uh and spend all of this time uh, sort of talking about, uh, and this happens, I think a lot in, in sort of first interactions. So if we talk about it, um, if we talk about it in sort of the relationship building in the business world, this is the person who doesn't let you get a word in edgewise while they're talking about all of their accomplishments. Right. But if we get into the dating world, you know, this is often the person who basically, you know, spends the whole time talking about themselves (laughs) and never asks you, you know, never asks you about, uh, about you, but it's, it's one of these things where it's so important for us to understand that it's dialogue that causes Mm -hmm. connection. It's not monologues. You're never going to impress people with a monologue. You're going to impress people so much more with a dialogue. And, and I, I was talking about this when we were doing our interview, I often like to say that you cannot underestimate the significance of making someone else feel significant. Mm -hmm. And the more that you take that time to understand them, to talk to them, to get to see what it is that is going on in their world and how things, you know, and how things are going and, and really listen. Right. I think that's the other thing. It's like, yeah, you're, the best skill that you can uh, that you can work on is active listening. 
because it's one of the hardest things to do in the world that we live in because we are loaded with distractions. So somebody may say something or you may see something out of the corner of your eye that gets your attention and you may miss four or five parts of a conversation. So the more that you practice active listening and say, okay, am I really paying attention to what this person's saying or am I off in, you know, sort of my own, my, my own world? the better your conversations are going to be because so, so often people aren't listened to. Somebody asks them a question uh, that they just answered or whatever the mm-hmm. scenario is because they're in their own head and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't lead to deep, intimate conversations. And ideally, that's what you want. You want somebody to walk away from a conversation and say, wow. I just like, I really loved that experience. And that actually ties into this influence, you know, category because everybody thinks influence is about persuasion. And it's because there's been so many things written about, about persuasion, but true influence is when people do things without you asking them to, right? Mm-hmm. And they do that because it gives them something. They do that because they feel good. So if you, if you, create that environment in which the other person feels felt right and they're just like wow you really listened to me you really paid you really paid attention then they are far more likely to remember your conversation with them than they are to any number of the other people that have basically given them a monologue or given them an interrogation oh so many gold nuggets yeah and that you know what's interesting about the dialogue versus the monologue I feel like the monologue could be two things. One could be the person who's just constantly talking, but it also could be the inner monologue of people just never saying anything at all. Mm -hmm. And then they're just sitting there being the audience, but it's the inner monologue. And, and I think that it is a balancing act to your point, because either way, when it's imbalanced, it never feels good or you attract lopsided relationships. So the takers will always want the over givers. Oh yeah. And so the more you show up for yourself and have a dialogue and say what's in the inner monologue, (laughs) then that's when people really can feel you too. Honestly, I even relate this to chemistry and attraction what you're talking Mm -hmm. about because, you know, people, and of course I I work on the outside and all the, you know, body language and the way we dress that, that is part of attraction. However, the way we communicate also is so powerful. Like we really can feel when someone's listening to us. And that is, you know, when you walk away from an interaction or a date and say, wow, I I would love to see them again. I, I don't know why. I just, I just like them. You know, yeah. and that is, it's, it's just so powerful. And I, I love that you're teaching this and focusing on this in all aspects of life. It's such an important skill too, that I don't think many people talk about. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And I mean, when it comes to, I've had this conversation all the time with coaches and consultants where yeah. in essence, I often will tell them, you've got to give yourself an F and uh, the, the, <laughs> And basically what it comes down to is most of the time coaches and consultants spend all of their time talking about what they do Mm -hmm. and what they want to talk about is what they do for their clients. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very subtle distinction, but it is arguably one of the most important distinctions because if people don't understand what it is that you can do for the client, they're not going to ever refer you because we make referrals again, because it makes us look better. So if, if we have an understanding of how somebody else solves somebody else's problem, we want to come into, you know, that position for our friends and say, yeah, you're struggling with that. I met somebody who can fix that. I met somebody who's dealt with this before. Would you like to meet them? And we look good, right? Because we're coming to the table with somebody who can help. And that's a whole different sort of equation than, yeah, I met this coach and they, uh, you know, they're experienced in NLP and I think they walked on fire at one point. Oh, Um, I know who you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and they've got all these things, you know, uh, and do you, you know, do you want to work with them? It's like, well, what, 
what can what they do did, for me? What do they actually do? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I could go to a Vegas show and see that. I don't know how that's going to benefit me. Yeah, yeah, it is so true. And honestly, again, I, I just love connecting the dating and the metaphors. Same thing with dating. Like just because you're on a date with someone that's not your match why not use that as an opportunity to make a connection? Because you don't know who they know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I refer to this as the OCG framework. So Mm -hmm. if something comes your way Mm -hmm. um, and it truly is the fit for you, it's the best, you know, it's the, it's, it's the best thing, then it really is an opportunity. But if something comes your way and it's not a fit for you, it's not an opportunity. It's simply a coincidence that you ended up in that situation Mm -hmm. with, you know, that, thing that was presented to you. And what most people do is they let go of whatever that thing is. They, they don't do anything with that coincidence that came their way. But what you can do that's significantly more effective is you can take your coincidence and you can turn it into a gift for someone else. Mm. who you think this person would really benefit from this. And I do this all the time with speaking where people will reach out to me and say, I really want you to come and speak about this. or I want you to do this type of thing. And if it's not really a fit, if I'm just like, yeah, I think you got me wrong. I think, you know, I think uh, I I don't say, Oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do it. Good luck. I say, listen, I'm not the right person for this, but this speaker would be far more comprehensive on this topic than, than, than I would. And if you're open to it, I'd be happy to introduce you. And then I share that person's information or I connect those two, you know, those two people. And it's, it's one of those things where we get invites all the time. Right. And, you know, this is actually a really great way. And I think this could apply both in business and and relationships is a great way to follow up with people, Mm -hmm. you know, is this aspect of you get invited to something and uh, you might not be able to go, or you get an extra ticket as sort of like a random, um, as, as a random thing, why not reach out to somebody who you haven't touched base with in a while and basically say, Hey, would you like a, you know, a seat to this, or would you like to come with me to the, you know, to this particular thing? It's a great way to reconnect with people who you haven't touched base with. And it basically uses this thing that likely was just going to go in your trash folder, you know? Yeah. Oh, and and then because I also think with that mindset, you know, moving throughout the world, going on dates, going to events is so much more pleasant knowing Mm -hmm. that you're not going there. I call it being so target specific. You're just going there for the sake of being curious and connection. I mean, those are the two words I use all the time. And when you do that, so so many things come out of that and it's so much more fun. <laughs> it's not yes. as painful going to the, Oh, I got to go to this or that. Oh, I have to go on another date. Great. What can you learn from that person? Yeah. And I think the, the point that, that you make there about playful is probably one of the most important points, right? Where it's like, yeah. if we look at these things as work, if we look at these things as these like have to do things, right. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to, we're going to put way more weight onto it. You know, but if we look at these things as play and we look at these things as these like interesting sort of playful experiences and, and what can I learn and what's, you know, what's an experiment that I can try and, and we treat it with that levity, then we're able to just do it easier and we're able to just kind of move through it. And if it's not a fit for us, if something doesn't work out again, we're not in that tennis novice place, right? We're in that tennis pro place of, okay, yeah, well, who else could this be for? Or what else, you know, what other things can I learn here? And you just, you get rid of all of that hyper massive pressure that comes from, you know, expectation. And I have this conversation with people in their brands all the time where it's, you know, a lot of people will talk about, you know, the fact that they, they, they're doing this big rebrand and they want this thing to be kind of perfect and they want to, you know, and, and I'll often tell them that you need to test these things in the market and you need to be open to the fact that whatever you think is perfect, whatever you think is the thing everybody wants to see might not actually be the thing that everybody wants to see. Mm, Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, And that relates to like just being in your head and having your own agenda rather than seeing what, what comes out of uh, interaction. 
and what people can give you back. So, yeah. Michael, this was such a great conversation. I literally, we could go on and riff for hours, I think. On I know, topic. right? <laughs> <laughs> but we do, as all good things must come to an end. Um, do, tell everyone where they can find you and anything that you have going on. Sure, sure. Um, so, uh, my website is just smallpawnenterprises.com, and you can sign up for my daily email there. You can see where the podcast is, all of that kind of stuff. And if you're specifically interested in referability, um, I have a tool uh, that's a referability rater, uh, where basically Ooh. you can take a test and it'll tell you kind of which areas of referability you are doing well in and which areas you're not. Uh, and that's just at myreferabilityrater.com. So it's pretty, uh, pretty easy uh, to, uh, to access. And yeah, you can always reach out to me on the socials, you know, at any of the, uh, at any of the channels, the, the book of faces, the, the LinkedIn, <laughs> you know, all of that, uh, all of that fun stuff. Yeah, no, I am. You're very easy to find and, and all of you should find, and we'll have um, the links in the show notes as well. Well, Michael, thank you so much again. I'm sure like, I'd love to have you back. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, this was an absolute blast. And yeah, would love to would love to continue and have uh, and have more conversations. So thanks for joining me today. This has been the Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, of course, Kimmy Seltzer. And remember, you can build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. And if you want to know more, make sure you go to my site, KimmySeltzer.com. And here's the thing. If you are over 40 and having a hard time meeting people and building connections for your dating life... I have an exciting announcement. I am doing another flirt workshop, and I decided to extend the date to October 19th. October 19th is the new date, and this time I'm focusing on how to do it in your 40s, 50s, and 60s. It's an interactive workshop for both men and women. This is not just a talking head webinar. It's an actual workshop where we are going to practice learning about the fundamentals of networking and flirting later later in life, and how to get your sexy on, create attraction, and land dates no matter what age you are at. So just click the link in the show notes to register now because seats are limited. And remember, working on you is working on your dating life. Mm-hmm.